So on Thursday, the European Parliament passed a resolution which called for the extension of the EU crime list to include hate speech and hate crimes. The vote passed overwhelmingly with 397 for, 121 against and 26 abstentions. Uh, these crimes could now be added to the EU's list of particularly serious crimes that have impact beyond national borders, which means all member states would have to introduce binding minimum penalties. So here to discuss this, I have the lawyer and author, Luke Gittos. Welcome to the show, Luke. So talk us through this, because I was always already under the impression that there are hate speech laws across Europe, in any case, in individual countries. Why is this different? Yeah, there are. So the, the, the change really is that the European Union have a set of minimum standards for what has to be illegal in member states uh, in order to uh, remain a member state of the European Union. So they have minimum standards that say, look, you have to make this illegal, otherwise you can't be a member state. Yes. And those are called Euro crimes, sometimes abbreviated to Euro crimes. And normally they were things like terrorism, human trafficking. And you think, well, fair enough. You know, you want to make those things illegal and keep them illegal. And it's perfectly reasonable to set minimum standards of that kind. Yes. Uh, the Euro, th th this development means that um, hate speech will be added to that list. OK. Now, of course, that becomes a lot more problematic for a lot of people because... Uh, hate speech can mean different things to different people. I mean, we, you, you've sp spoken about this a lot on your show. Um, and effectively, what this development would do is pass a lot of power to Brussels to decide what is and is not hate speech. And it's right to see this, uh, if I can briefly, without sending your audience to sleep, talk a little bit more about EU law, which I know is a difficult thing to say. No, but it's important from. that we understand. So Yeah, so there's a thing called the Digital Services Act, which came in under uh, a big part of Ursula von der Leyen, who is the president of the European Commission, under her policy platform. Uh, and von der Leyen uh, was very much behind the Digital Services Act, which effectively would um, introduce across the EU new powers for the Commission to punish uh, digital service providers, people like uh, X or Twitter, uh, if they fail to crack down on illegal speech. Yes. And now, so this development kind of tailgates at the end, uh, you know, following that. And, what, and so what we're really seeing is the emergence of this new legal framework to allow the uh, European Commission and, U and the EU uh, to be more involved in censorship. I mean, that's yes. what we're seeing, the unfolding of a, of, a, of a legislative framework that will expand their reach into... Uh, more censorious, uh, you know, more censorious activity. And that, 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 they've been quite explicit about that. You know, they had a very explicit um, and open spat with Elon Musk uh, in the course of the last two years, where they've effectively accused him of propagating disinformation, misinformation. They threatened legal action. They threatened to shut down Twitter's operation across the EU, which, if you think about it, is completely extraordinary that yes. they would even think about threatening um, Twitter with, some, with something like that. But they've done that. And, and this, I think, we can see as kind of an overall climate of lawmaking uh, within Brussels, where, where they see themselves as the gatekeepers of information. Of, of information. And that should scare us, actually. I mean, yes. e EU law is pretty boring, but it all can be quite scary because, the, you know, the European Commission is not elected, it's appointed. Um, the European Parliament is elected, but it, it functions with what we call, you know, there is a democratic deficit, meaning that we, we, most of us don't know who our European uh, right. Member of Parliament is. Um, no, none of us vote for the European Commission. So there is this gap between the public and the, and, well, and the EU lawmaking. Well, the European Commission is not just like the civil service or something. You know, they have far more, far more power than that. Yeah, right? they do. They, they set the legislative agenda for the European Union and then the European Parliament can vote on what the European Commission proposes their, as their policy. Has the European Commission made any effort to define what they mean by hate speech? Yeah, they have. And it's, of course, very, very broad. So it, what, what, one thing they actually mirror... Um, in relation to UK hate speech laws is that they take their lead from how a victim experiences what is said. So that there are, you know, there's lots of definitions and, and one thing that's pretty consistent within the EU is actually finding out exactly what they, they mean is very difficult because everything is in different directives and different policies. But broadly they say, look, if something undermines someone's sense of identity or someone's rights, then that can constitute hate speech. So if someone's offended... In other words. But, I mean, it, yeah, you, you, could, you could see it going in that direction, couldn't you? And, and in this country, you know, we've seen uh, hate speech laws fa fairly frequently used to punish things like uh, uh, gender-critical ideology. You know, it's been, it's been very involved in the discussion around gender, yes. with people being arrested and interviewed by the police for saying things which are perceived to be transphobic, for example. And jokes, in fact. And jokes, of course. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So... I think the, the worrying thing is that when you take um, your definition of hate speech as to be, well, whatever someone experiences as hate speech, yes. then really there is no uh, limit 
on what can be criminalised. And when you add to that that this is being implemented by a, a body that has not been elected mm. and cannot be voted out, mm. then you've got basically the ingredients for, for a kind of authoritarianism, haven't you? Well, I think at the very least, it makes it, it gives grist to the mill of those who are sceptical of the EU. I mean, I voted to leave the European Union, and I did so because I believe in um, national sovereignty. Mm. And on an issue like speech, you know, on what we should be free to say, you might think hate speech laws are a good idea, you might think they're a bad idea. But I think if you're a Democrat, you should think that they should be elected uh, and voted for by the public, and they should be critiqued by the public, and the public should have complete control over what is and is not illegal to say. Yes. That seems to me an absolute foundational issue for a democracy. So we'll... no matter what you think of the laws, you're right to say that the fact that the people introducing potentially very censorious laws not being elected, I think, is a real issue. Will uh, EU member states be able to opt out of this? Uh, well, as everything within the EU, there is politics involved here. And I think what we have to see... Uh, you know, there is a culture war within the EU at the moment. We're, we're currently approaching a very serious vote within uh, the European Parliament, which may see Hungary taking the leadership of very, very important meetings. And, of course, that's causing some serious consternation because Hungary is often seen as an outlier within the EU. Yes. There are other countries that seek, uh, similarly just refuse to toe the line on particular issues, particularly around kind of culture war-style uh, politics. So countries... Um, can opt out, but uh, that has consequences. Whenever you break the rules of the EU, there are consequences, and that can mean uh, certain restrictions in how you participate. So the, the, the reality is that e the EU often exercises soft power. It's not like they have legal power to change um, the rules or laws that a particular government passes. They don't have that kind of power, but they can. But they are influential, and yes. the, the fact that membership is contingent on passing certain laws or not it, it is influential. Yes, but you mentioned uh, th this um, attack on free speech via the internet, and particularly the run-ins that the EU has had with mm. Elon Musk over this. But then, on the other hand, in Britain, we have left the EU, so we are not subject to these ideas. However, we've just passed the, the online safety bill, which sounds an awful lot like it's doing the same thing. In other words, uh, saying to uh, big tech platforms, you have to be responsible for what appears on your site. And if, if misinformation appears there, you are liable. Yeah, exactly. So really, we haven't, we're doing the same thing, aren't we? No, exactly. And the one thing that the, 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 the right like to do in this country is blame the EU for everything and pretend yeah. that all of these are EU-specific problems. But, of course, national legislatures, our government, our parliament, are just as free to pass censorious legislation, and they continue to do so. As you point out, the uh, online safety bill is an extremely serious uh, threat to the way that we conduct ourselves online. So it's always open to governments to, to, to go as far and further yes. than the EU in their attempts to curb freedom of but speech. But is, is it not the case that we're losing this? You know, the, the EU are doing this. We've had um, Ireland are introducing this incredibly draconian hate speech legislation, which they can't even define. They don't even attempt to define hatred other than via a circular definition that brings you back to hatred, mm. whatever that means. The, Scot the Scottish government, of course, uh, uh, criminalising things that you say in your own home. Now, are we moving in the wrong direction, broadly speaking, across Europe on this issue of hate speech? I think the answer is probably yes. I mean, it's, it's important to emphasise um, people... In case people aren't familiar with what the real problem with hate speech law is, you know, it's, it, it might seem to people to be easy to be against hatred, but, of course... Often what we're talking about here when we talk about these laws is passing power to the police and to the authorities to decide what is and is not acceptable to say. So one thing I've seen in my own practice as a criminal lawyer is, you know, I have to actually attend the police station and deal with these allegations when people are hauled up by the police, called in for interview, called into a police station to account for what they've said in the course of a private conversation. Now, of course, often these cases don't go anywhere. They're, they're discontinued before they're prosecuted or, uh, you know, they just don't proceed. But the point is that this has a real chilling effect on people. The mm. fact that there is a law out there which could be used to criminalise someone for what they say, it gives the impression that there is one acceptable body of, of opinion on particular issues. And I think that's the real risk of these laws, is that it creates this environment where people are afraid to say what they really think, they're afraid to debate and discuss issues in an open and, and informed way. And people are worried to express their true opinions. And although we, we, we do see prosecutions in this country and, 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 and elsewhere for, for what people say, we see people going to prison for what... I mean, I think we remember Count Dankula in Scotland going to prison for what he said. But he didn't go to prison, but was fine, found was, guilty and fined. Sure, f f found guilty and, and fined for, for what he said. Um, you don't see that... Very often. Mm. But what I think you, you, you do see, and I've seen it myself, is people being 
hauled into the police station and questioned. And that inevitably has a chilling effect on the way people talk about particular well, topics. One of the... I mean, I've spoken to many um, feminists in particular who have been visited by the police or mm. dragged in. What they say is that the experience... that the process is the punishment, mm. that the experience itself is so off-putting. And this might explain uh, why we haven't really been able to have a sensible conversation about this very important issue for so long in this country, because everyone's terrified to say anything. Yeah, quite. And then... Uh, you know, the, the kind of cultural impact of that is, is extremely serious. Yes. You know, we have to be free to debate these topics. The law is a blunt instrument. You know, it's an old saying, but it's a good one, in that it really should apply to the narrowest possible area of social life because yes. the more you expand the criminal law, the more you expand the way that the justice system intervenes in our lives, um, the less freedom we have to Absolutely. talk, to debate and discuss. And that means a restricted ability to hold people to account. Yeah. And hold ideas to account, perhaps more importantly. This is exactly how bad ideas take hold. The more you allow them to simply exist without being challenged, the more the bad ideas can take hold. And we should worry about that in a democracy. Luke Gittos, thanks very much for joining me.